Well, children, have you heard of Superman before? Yes. Oh, you have? Oh, I'm not that old then. Very good. I'm glad. Now, Superman, what does Superman do when he's not being Superman? Oh, so I am old, aren't I? See, the uh, old Superman, he wasn't just Superman, he did something else too. And it, maybe I can ask the adults, what did Superman do? He was a reporter, that's right. Very good. Maybe we should do adults talk and then the children can listen in. And so the, he was a reporter in, his, in the daytime and he'd sit there and write articles, but it was pretty handy because, you know, he's Superman, so he could type really fast. But being Superman, he had to save people as well, didn't he? So... He would run into a telephone booth and he would do his magical thing and instantaneously get changed into his costume and then run out and save the day. This is really old Superman, I know. It's not very exciting. But let me ask you a question. Who was the real Superman? Was it Superman or was it the man in the reporting costume? The man in the reporting costume? No, you would think so, but it's not. You see, the real one is Superman. Because that's who he really is. And then what he does is he, he acts like a reporter so that people don't know that he's Superman. Because he has to keep his identity secret. But his real person, who he really is, is Superman with a cape on who is really strong and can do anything and everything. Now, in our story today, we're going to see Jesus a little bit like that. You see, when we see Jesus on the earth, he's man, and he's completely man. So he, he doesn't fly. He doesn't hover around the place. And yet he's God, isn't he? And in today's passage, we're going to see a little bit of the real Jesus. And what I mean by the real Jesus is we're going to see a little bit of the God that Jesus is in what we call the transfiguration, which is a really big word, which basically means changed, because Jesus changes for a short period of time, and the disciples see what he, what he really looks like. They get to see his glory. And what we're going to see is that Jesus is completely God, and that he is glorious, just like we've been seeing over all these recent weeks as we've been looking at all these different appearances of God. So let's pray, and let's ask God to help us understand these things. Dear God, we thank you for the way that you are always ministering to us and caring for us. Thank you for these children and your love for them. We pray, Lord, that you would work in their hearts, that these truths may be pressed upon them. We pray for our parents as they care for them, that you would help them to love them and reach out to them. Help us as a church to gather around these children and to show them the love of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're turning this morning to the Gospel of Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. For the sake of our visitors, we've been working our way through a small thematic series on the theophany of theophanies of God. If you don't know what a theophany is, it's when God appears, when he shows up, when he manifests himself and makes himself known. And so we're, we've looked exclusively through the Old Testament up till now. But now we're turning to Luke chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at the, what's commonly called the transfiguration. And I'd like us, just to put it in its context, to read from verse 18 of chapter 9 through to verse 36. This is God's holy and inerrant word for you this morning. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself 
and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, about eight days after these sayings, He took with them Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzlingly white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were departing from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Amen. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word to us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this glorious account, true account of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you'd help us to understand it. Would you help us to have ears to hear and hearts to believe what the Spirit is saying to the churches? Lord, we we have minds which are, which are distracted by many things, hearts which are concerned about many things. And so we pray that you help us for this next little while to concentrate on you. Lord, we pray that you would minister to us this morning. Minister to our hearts. That your word may encourage, rebuke, exhort, build up. Cause us to reject godlessness and accept holiness. Cause us to look to Christ. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, over, over the last few weeks, as I said, we've been looking at all Old Testament passages so far. And so, you know, we've seen Abraham and we've seen Isaiah and Moses and Moses and Moses and Ezekiel and Elijah And one of the things that's really easy to do when we look at Old Testament passages is is kind of to just go, oh, yeah, but that's the Old Testament. You know, you sort of just almost put it under the that used to happen back then thing. That was just something that God did crazily just millions of years ago, and it just feels like so long ago it never, ever existed. And we can treat them almost like fairy tale stories. Or heart. It's not that we're denying their truthfulness, but they seem so far-fetched and so far away that it's hard sometimes for us to hold on to them really solidly. And yet now we come a lot closer to home, don't we? We're no longer in the incredible stories of the Old Testament on mountains and in wildernesses with bushes on fire and everything else. We're no longer on mountain peaks with earthquakes and fire and thunder. We're now on a small hill with Jesus and three men. 
You know, as we as we read this story, it feels it feels far closer to our reality, doesn't it? So you you can imagine yourself just quietly walking up Clevedon Hill. Just walking up a hill. And you can experience that yourself. And you know, you're not stuck in a wilderness, but you're just walking quietly up a hill with a man you love. That's what these disciples were doing. And so today, in a sense, we're actually seeing one of the greatest theophanies in the Bible. I mean, the greatest theophany is the incarnation of Christ. But that topic's way too big for one sermon. But I'd like us to consider one of the greatest appearances of God that happens in the Bible. It says... Three disciples walk up a mountain. But, but to appreciate what's going on for these disciples, we do have to understand the context because Luke clearly points out in verse 28 that this is connected. He says, eight days after these sayings. You don't say that for no reason, do you? It's not just randomly, oh, by the way, you need to know that eight calendar days later. No, he's pointing backwards. He's saying something happened eight days ago. That's connected to this. So what happened eight days ago? Well, eight days ago, as we read in verse 18 to 20, Jesus questions the disciples. Who who does everyone say I am? They say, well, a bunch of different prophets. But who do you say I am? And they say, well, we're not going to say you're one of the prophets because we know you're not one of the prophets. And Peter says, you are Christ, the Christ of God, meaning you are the Messiah promised all throughout the Old Testament who will redeem the people of Israel. This is not just a a cliche title they're throwing out. This is profound significance. And then Jesus, in response to that, shows them what the Messiah is called to do and be. And so in verse 21 to 22, he highlights that the Messiah, the Son of Man, is going to die, brutally die, and yet come back to life after three days. And then, assuming there's a crowd around them, he turns to everyone around him, or maybe this is a little bit later on, he looks at the group that's around him, whether it's disciples or crowds, we're not really told, and he says, if any of you want to follow me, you have to join me in the same path. You take up your cross, follow me, die to yourself and gain eternal life. And then he makes this profound statement in verse 27 that has caused no small amount of confusion in different Christian spheres. He says, I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. What does he mean by that? I mean, Don't ask the scholars, you just get confused. About 50,000 different opinions, although that's true for pretty much everything. The, what's he ta- is he talking about maybe his death, you know, like his death and resurrection and ascension and the incoming of the Holy Spirit and the establishment of the church? We could be. Or is he talking just about the kingdom of God that he's always teaching about? And in a sense, they've already seen it. But that would be seen, weird to say that you will see it. I think logically, it makes the most sense to see it connected to this, doesn't it? Jesus says to them, some of you will see the reality, effectively, the reality of the kingdom of God. And then eight days later, he turns to three of them and says, let's go for a walk, lads. We need need to go and pray. And so he turns in verse 28 to Peter, John, and James, and he says to them, let's go up the mountain. And I'd like us to, to look at this passage as God reveals the kingdom of God to them. And I'd like us to look at it through three realities. Firstly, we're going to see the disciples ascend to glory. Then we're going to see the disciples asleep to glory. And then we're going to see the disciples awaken to glory. So we're going to see them ascend, asleep, and then awake. So firstly, they ascend to glory. Jesus grabs his three disciples and he takes them up the mountain. And have you ever wondered why the three disciples? Could you imagine being the other nine? I mean, we often talk about Peter, James, and John, but what about Bartholomew? How come no one ever talks about Bartholomew? Have you ever heard a sermon on Bartholomew before? We're not told anything about him. 
Well, what about Judas, not Iscariot, the other guy? He, all we know of him is that he's not Judas Iscariot. That's what we know of him. But these other nine disciples get left behind. Why does Jesus pick three disciples? And I, I want to suggest there's two reasons why. Firstly, in the Old Testament, it states that every witness, every witness is to be settled with two or three people. So if you bring an accusation, if you bring testimony, it must be by two or three witnesses. You see, if, if only Peter comes up and, and then Peter writes down what happens and he writes, well, I went up the mountain and I saw Jesus look like God. Everyone can say, well, it's just your opinion. That doesn't mean anything. But now here we have three specific witnesses who can bear testimony to the reality of these things. We know that they're not lying. We can trust what they tell us about what they saw on this mountain. Can I, can I just tell you for a second? We have a sure faith. And this was really highlighted yesterday at the creation ministries thing. That, you know, the world wants to tell us that we're just believing in this crazy stuff. We have rock solid, firm evidence for what we believe in. You do not have to have doubt about what the word says. In every place, God has provided evidence and provisions for everything we believe. You can have confidence in this story. This is not just Luke's crazy imagination. In fact, all three gospel writers, set John aside, the other three gospel writers all record this story with incredible similarity. Because three men bore witness that this is true. But, but there's something more significant than that. Do you remember, it was a couple of weeks ago, so I know it's a stretch for all of us. A few weeks ago, we looked at Moses, and Moses and the elders went up the mountain. You remember that? Do you remember who he took with him? God says, Moses, I want you to come up the mountain, and I want you to bring with me Aaron and his two sons, and the 70. And so you get this picture in the way it's written of Moses and then these three men following up the mountain with a crowd of 70 behind them. And I can't help but imagine that what Jesus is doing in this instant is pointing back to what Moses did. Moses went up the mountain with these three men to witness the glory of God. And now Jesus grabs these three disciples and says, we're going up the mountain. They don't know why. They have no clue what they're doing. They think they're just going up to pray. It's all we're doing is we're going to go up and have some prayer time with Jesus. I mean, that would have been incredible as it is. Can you imagine sitting and listening to Jesus pray? The disciples wander up the mountain for a time of prayer with Jesus. Have you noticed have you noticed as we've gone through this series how often prayer is mentioned? And that it's not me just creatively squeezing it into the passage? It's just time and time and time again, there is a connection between God working marvelously and people having communion with God. That's what prayer is. Prayer is communion with God. Sometimes it's out of desperate need. Sometimes it's, it's just out of fasting and prayer. Sometimes it's viewing a broken church like Daniel. So a heap of different reasons why, but there seems to always be this connection between a people communing with God, hunger for God, and God moving in power. And this shouldn't surprise us because it's throughout the Bible and it's throughout church history. Just everywhere you look. Every movement of God follows prayer. God has promised in his word that he will answer prayer. Now, what does Jesus say? We saw it when we worked through John. Pray for anything, whatever you pray, whatever you pray in my name, I will grant you. And, and I, just, I just wonder, 
If one of the reasons the church has so lost its power and lost its its passion for the glory of God is that actually we're not really hungry for it. One of the the greatest descriptions of what a revival is that I've seen is revival is when the people of God become hungry and thirsty for the glory of God, for God himself. And as that hunger and thirst builds, it changes the people of God and they begin to, to come more proactively and they start asking for more. It's not being forced upon them. They're begging for more. Give me more. Give me more. And the preacher stops preaching. They say, don't stop. Carry on preaching. And they say, can we have another prayer meeting? Because we just want more of God. And then, then the world sees that and says, what on earth is going on in that place? Something, something weird about these people. Look at them. And they, and they want to find out. And they come and then they begin to get a hunger in themselves. Because we as humans naturally should have a hunger for God. And I just wonder, part of the reason is we're not, I mean, we're not really that hungry. Five minutes is enough, a bite to eat things, just a snack on the side. Well, Jesus was taking his disciples up to show them what communion looked like. And he must have, I assume he prayed for a really long time because the disciples eventually fall asleep. So we see the disciples ascend to the glorious mountain, and then we find the disciples sleeping. It's hard to know, actually, in in the Greek, it's really hard to know if they're asleep or if they're just like dozing really heavily. It it doesn't make a great deal of difference, but you can picture it, can't you? Jesus is off praying, and, and it's got Gethsemane written all over it, but Jesus is off praying, and the disciples are sitting somewhere casually under a tree having a nap. And and there's a a preacher who put it really wonderfully. He says, the disciples were at it again. If there was one thing the disciples excelled at, and this may have been the only thing, it was their extraordinary ability to slumber, especially when it was time to pray. And it's so true, isn't it? Jesus goes and prays, disciples sleep. Jesus goes and prays, disciples sleep. And you know, the, the, the terrible thing is, as they sleep, they actually miss out on so much of the glory of this event. You realize, just, just think for a second, they wake up when, when the two prophets are leaving. So they, they miss out on seeing Christ transfigure. They, they miss out on hearing the conversation. So why do you think we don't know what they said? We know vaguely what they talked about. We don't know what they said. Because the disciples were sleeping on the side. You know, and, and as humans, we can't stand this, can we? How do you feel when one of your work colleagues sleeps on the job? Doesn't it really frustrate you when you're working hard and you see your colleague fast asleep? You're like, I'm, I'm trying to work hard and, and you're just sleeping? You know, we've got deadlines to meet. This is going to cost me later. But can't we also slumber in the presence of the glorious, just like these disciples? These disciples are sitting in, in front of Jesus Christ. They're sitting in front of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. Oh, of course, they don't understand that at this moment. But they're sitting in the presence of Jesus, praying to his Father in heaven. It must have been the most profound prayer you could ever imagine. And he's, and he's praying, and he's praying, and he's praying, and maybe two hours roll by, and he's just he's pouring out his heart before his Father in heaven. And they're missing all of it. They're missing the splendor of watching two persons of the Trinity commune together. I can't comprehend what it must be like to witness two persons of the Godhead ministering to each other. And they missed it because they were asleep. And we can be like this, can't we? I mean, if we're just brutally honest with ourselves, let's be brutally honest. It's really easy to concentrate through a whole sports event, isn't it? It's really easy to concentrate through a good movie. 
It's really easy to sit through a good meal with the person we love. It's really hard to sit through a sermon, isn't it? I mean, you don't have to nod, but I know. I sit down there sometimes. It's hard work, isn't it? I come to two prayer meetings every week. It's hard work to concentrate. It's very regular. You can ask Josella. It's very regular on Thursday at dinner time that I look at Josella and say, I really don't want to go to the prayer meeting tonight. I'd rather just sit home on my bum and do nothing. And like the good wife she is, she says, well, firstly, you haven't got a choice because you're running it. But secondly, you know it'll be good for you. And it always is. But why is it? that we can slumber. I mean, can you just think for a second what we theoretically know to be true, that right now, in this very second, as I'm speaking human words to you, God himself is speaking to you. The Holy Spirit right now is working, and this is beyond comprehension, is working in me to produce the current words I'm saying, while at the same time working in your heart and in your mind to make you interpret them and understand them and cause them to feed your soul. And he's doing that to every single one of you. That as you open your mouth and sing, the words that you are saying are ascending through physical realities to where God is seated in heaven and angels are hearing them and a myriad of the universal church are gathered around you worshiping God at the same time and we slumber through it. Because our hearts, our hearts so quickly get dragged away by this world. I tell you, I was speaking to someone this week and, and, and they were just saying how, how important it is for us to, to be feeding every day. You know, and, he, and he was describing how, how he, when, he, when he drives in his car, he, he loves to listen to things and when he does work, he, he listens to things and it helps him concentrate. And it's like, that, yeah, that's it, isn't it? Just this daily feeding. It's so easy to hop in our car and switch on talkback radio and hear a bunch of people gripe about stuff. Or, or hop in and just turn some great music on. I love music. But what happens if we jump in our car and we turn the audio Bible on? Or if we turn a great sermon on? Or if we turn some worship music on? We turn something on that fixates ourselves upon the glory of Christ so that it's not a bite at the end of the week or the beginning of the week, depending how you set your calendar on your phone app. It's just a taste, you know, so often it's just a taste for us. It's just enough things. But what, honestly, what would it look like if we did this to our husbands and wives? Or our fiancés? Just think about what it was like, you married couples, when, when you were first engaged. And just imagine, ladies, that, that you ring up your fiancé and you say to him, "Hun, should we go out and do something? He said, oh, I already saw you this week. It's ridiculous, isn't it? But isn't, isn't it so often how our, our hearts can act? I see God once a week, that's enough. It's not a relationship, is it? And, and yet Jesus takes these men up the mountain and he, he points them to something and they're fast asleep. But praise be to God because God wakes them up. You know, they could have stayed asleep for two hours longer and missed the entire thing. They could have. But God, in his grace and mercy, causes these three men to waken from their slumber. And isn't that what we need? Don't we need it? We, the reality is we can't awaken ourselves. We can do things to try, but ultimately we need God to awaken us. And yes, it begins with prayer. But look, these, these three men are lying there asleep under a tree or something, and God comes along and wakes them up. And they open up their eyes. They awaken to the glorious. Can you just comprehend what it must have been like? You're waking up. What are you expecting to see as the disciples? You're expecting to see Jesus probably on his knees and face over there praying, and then you're expecting to feel real guilty because you did it again. And they open up their eyes and they see three people. 
but they don't see three people. They see three people in glory. They see Christ resplendent in majesty. It says in verse 29, the appearance of his face was altered. The word for altered is, is heteros. And it's, it's, it's like saying his face was like that of no other. It's really hard to find a, a good translation. It's a face like you've never seen on a person before. His clothing became dazzlingly white. And there were two men, Moses and Elijah. I'd love to know how they knew it was Moses and Elijah. There's no photos of the Old Testament. How did they know? Was it the beards? Like, I, I don't know. Somehow they, they just knew. They looked at these two men and said, it's Moses and Elijah. Who else could it be? I can only assume the Holy Spirit revealed it to them. But they see them. But notice that Moses and Elijah appear in glory. You know, this is such a glorious hope. Here come two men. Remember, Eli El remember Elijah didn't die. So this is not some spiritual ghost. These are people. And, and Moses is a person. He dies. No one knows where he gets buried. And both of them turn up here and they're they're glorious. They're surrounded by glory. Do you know what that means for you? That means when you die, it'll be the same for you. Because they're not extra holy. It's not because they're extra holy in prophets that they turn up like this. It's because they've begun to receive the glory of the gift that we get in Christ Jesus. I tell you, that is such a blessed hope. As you think about your loved ones that have gone before you, this is them. They surround the throne of God, partially glorified, awaiting their final consummated bodies, worshipping God. But they come for a specific purpose, don't they? These two men come as messengers, and they spoke of his departure. If you've got a little footnote, you'll see that down at the bottom of the page, it says Greek exodus. It's just the word for exodus. They spoke of his exodus. What does it mean to speak of his exodus? Well, what happened at the exodus? The people of God were redeemed. They came to speak of the redemption he was to accomplish. You see, one thing that we often do is, is we overemphasize, it sounds weird to say, but we overemphasize the deity of Christ and underemphasize his humanity, and we end up with a lopsided Christ. And so we picture Christ turning up as a baby with complete knowledge of everything. Jesus knew as much as you did when you were born as a human being. Just comprehend that. He had to learn stuff. He had to learn how to read. If you went up to Jesus and said to him, Jesus, can you fly an airplane? Do you know what he would say? He would say, sorry, I don't understand you. I don't speak English. <laughs> but, and he wouldn't be able to fly an airplane. Would he? Because he's human. And so Jesus didn't have imprinted in his mind instantaneously how he was going to die and how he was going to achieve salvation. What did he do? He picked up the word of God and he started reading it. And he spent his years reading it and reading it and reading it and reading it and reading of the suffering servant in Isaiah and reading of the lamb who was to be slain and reading in the Psalms that they will look on him who will be pierced and reading in the Psalms on the one whose bones will not be broken. And as he reads it, he begins to put together the pieces. And as he's doing his ministry, he says to his disciples, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised again. And and then these two men turn up. Do you know what they say? You're right. Yeah. The roads to the cross. Your departure. You've, you've got to go and die. You're on the right path, Jesus. And so God graciously meets his son and provides him with understanding of the revelation of salvation that is to be won. And as the disciples fully wake up, they're finally clued on to what's going on. The, the two men are leaving, and Peter yells out, wait, let's build some tents. 
He wants to keep... I mean, look, I, I don't blame Peter. It must have been pretty magnificent. What's the tenth thing about... He doesn't want it to end. Would you want it to end? It's easy for us to say, oh, Peter's such a, you know, such an idiot. It's like, you would have done the same thing. It's like, this is amazing. Let's stay here forever. I want to talk to Moses. And as soon as he's like in the middle of speaking the words, this cloud descends. What's with the cloud? Let me ask you, what happens when the tabernacle starts? Moses builds the tabernacle and what happens? A big cloud descends on the tabernacle and it's the presence of God. And, and no one can go into the tabernacle because the glory of God is there. And, and then years and years later, the tent gets built. And what happens? Solomon builds the te temple. And what happens? This massive cloud falls down. And in it is the glory of God. And then you get to Ezekiel. And he has a vision. And in the vision, he sees the cloud descending once more on the temple and showing the glory of God. And now on this mountain, did you notice who the cloud descends upon? It falls upon Jesus Christ. And what, what is being shown is that this is the glory of God. You see, we, we've talked over and over again about needing to see the majesty, see the glory, see the splendor. Here it is. You don't need to look any further. Here it is. And out of the cloud, as it's, as it's surrounding the second person of the Trinity, as he is enveloped in the glory of his Father in heaven, this voice comes out which says, this is my son. This is my chosen one. Obey him. Listen to him. The father turns up and confirms everything about his son. You see, what God was doing is, is ultimately manifesting himself in Jesus Christ. And what he's showing us is that, is that we don't need to look for something else. You know, there's always that temptation, isn't there? There's always that temptation to look for something else. It's like the youth leader that said to me, what we just so desperately need is God to turn up and do something amazing. Then all the kids will believe in him. He's done something amazing. He has anointed his son. He has pointed us to his son. Has he awoken us to his son's glory? You see, that's the ultimate question, isn't it? See, it's all fine for me to say all these things, but, but if your heart isn't inflamed by them, you need something far, far more incredible. You need God to breathe life into your heart. And so I commend you, if, if, if this bores you, if this is ho-hum to you, Go home today. Go home today and fall upon your knees and say, Lord, give me eyes to see. Give me a heart to believe. Give me joy in the Lord. Give me a love for your glory. Help me to see Jesus. You know, he, he always answers that prayer. In, in 2 Peter, now this is, let, let's turn to, turn to 2 Peter 1. This is written so beautifully by the man who saw these things. You know, we think we need something special. We think we need something new. Peter, in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 16 and onward says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So we, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice 
was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain and we have the prophetic word. Now listen to this. Okay, just just pause, just listen to this. We were on the holy mountain and we actually heard God's audible voice as he spoke of Jesus and highlighted to him. And now hear what he says. We have the prophetic word more, more fully confirmed, more fully confirmed than hearing God himself speak audibly on top of a mountain to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Do you get what Peter's saying? He's saying this is more sure than what I heard and saw on the mountain. The thing you hold in your hand is a more sure testimony of the glory of God and the majesty of Christ than what they saw at the transfiguration. Do you, do you comprehend the treasure you hold in your hand right now? Oh, what a treasure. Read it and see the glory of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this majestic word which highlights the majesty of Christ. We thank you that we can trust it wholeheartedly. Give us eyes to see. Give us hearts that believe Help us, Lord, not to be complacent. Help us not to be cold-hearted. Cause our hearts, as Wesley said, to grow strangely warm. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.